Are you ready to get your feet wet? Because this is The Knowledge Pool, hosted by Gathering Information. We're here to bring you a casual conversation between friends about everything to do with collecting, trading, and playing Magic the Gathering. I am Tams. I am Steph. And I am Laura. So put on your bathing suits and dive right into The Knowledge Pool. Hello, and welcome to episode The Answer of The Knowledge Pool. It really is, isn't it? That's right. This is uh, episode 42, for those of you who don't get the reference. Who doesn't get that reference? Who plays magic? To be honest, at this point, it's been so done to death in pop culture that unless you've been living under a rock for the last 30 years, you should probably get it. That's fair. So, hi guys. (laughs) Hi. Hi. Tams. Me. How are we doing? Good, good, good. I'm a little loopy. <laughs> I I, have I'm going to go to bed after this. <laughs> <laughs> crazy schedules are crazy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there's lots to talk about today, which yeah. is kind of exciting. So, kind of intimidating, really. I guess we should just jump into it. Sh- shall we start with, with, with the big one? The the big the the big nasty. Uh, hmm, something that starts with R. The B and R list. Big, nasty yeah, see, thank you. Revision. Ah, I get you. So the banner restricted list was revised on Monday. They came out with their announcements. To the surprise of approximately nobody, there have been some changes in standard. Yeah, I was a little surprised at the actual contents, but after I I thought about it, it made perfect sense to me. Yeah. So people have been speculating that a tune with Aether would be banned just because it's kind of the linchpin that holds teamer energy together specifically and that really allows it to be that three color monster that we all know and are really bored of Mm. (laughs) um and also because it's a common it means that it won't really affect the prices of some of the more expensive highlight cards of the sets not that of course wizards takes any of that into account when doing their thinking at all because there's no secondary market no um so that was banned as well as rogue refiner Mm -hmm. which is the three two uncommon that draws you a card and gets you two energy. Super value, value guy. For the simple low, low price of a three mana, three two. So I honestly so expected good. that they were going to ban Aether Hub instead. Mm-hmm. But after the BNR announcement came out, I was thinking about it, and a tune does make more sense because Aether Hub actually uses your energy. Mm-hmm. So it's like, oh, this is draining the resource that we want to drain. That makes sense. Yeah, and like the it, other does, two it does ma- provide you with two energy to start with. But is it? I think it only gives you one, doesn't it? Okay, one energy. Uh, Versus, but then it immediately starts using all that up for any sort of mana. Colors. Yeah, and both of the cards they banned gave you two energy, which is like a whole extra mana, basically. Basically. So, um, yes, uh, in slightly more surprising news, um, taking kind of a hint from the last time they did these massive standard bans, they preemptively took a strike at Ram and Up Red, which they said, statistically completely crushed all of the other matchups except for Teamer Energy, and the only reason it hasn't taken over the format yet is because of Teamer Energy. So now that Teamer Energy is not in the format, perhaps quite as strongly, perhaps not at all, they just want to make sure that this will not completely stomp all over the competition. To me, this makes so much sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It really does. I looked and I went, what? Re- oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. Now, the reason I was excited to talk about this was because for somebody like me who doesn't play standard, and is not interested in playing standard simply because if you don't play one of the two decks, why bother playing? Mm -hmm. Um, This is exciting that there's a chance that maybe some new funky stuff might start rolling out. Mm -hmm. It also excites me that the next, what is it, two Pro Tours are not close to standard. Yeah. So we won't get the pros take on the format until after we have a chance to brew with it. Yeah, I also appreciate that. And not only that, there aren't actually that many standard specific events coming up really for the next few weeks. Like there are some team trios, which mm-hmm. do include standard, but you know, not all the pros are necessarily going to be there or they might be focusing more on you know their legacy or their modern side of things especially because modern itself is still really wide open and nobody solved that yet that we know of and that's the next pro tour it seems like if modern is kind of a coin flip format at the moment where you it's very matchup dependent Mm -hmm. then legacy and or sorry legacy or vintage legacy legacy, and uh standard would be the places they'd be focusing don't you think? Maybe, but you know, there's always the hope that maybe you come up with Callblade. 
or Eldrazi Winter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, well, I know what modern deck I'm interested in building, oh, geez, but yes. we'll get to that later, maybe. Okay, so specifically, in case you've been, in you know, in fact, living under that rock where uh-huh. you aren't sure of the red cards or the number 42, uh, they banned <laughs> Ramanap Red itself, the land. Ramanap Ruins, yeah. Yes, and then the uh, Rampaging Frostodome, which is uh, kind of an odd choice, except that then you consider the fact that a couple of the tribes that are really being pushed in Rivals for Ixalan are heavily token-dependent. Mm-hmm. Vampires and Norfolk, for example. Dinosaurs also do have some amount of token synergy as well. And suddenly you realize the fact that, you know, losing a life every time you have a creature come into play does certainly put a damper on some strategies that maybe wizards want to flourish a little bit. This also helps uh, decks in a really uh, synergistic around the white monument. Yeah. Which creates a soldier token whenever you test a creature. Mm, yeah. Mm-hmm. So. so, yeah, those bans are exciting because that means that the two um, most heavily played decks are not entirely gone. Mm-hmm. Like, you've still got your Cubs and... What, what was the red-green brawler that, that used to get a lot of play? There uh, was a red-green energy deck forever. No? Uh, I mean, there's the guy... Voltaic brawler? Yeah, 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 that sounds right. Um, and Cub are still around. Mm-hmm. Um, There's always Om on a red deck. Sure. The question is how good it is, but they're getting a couple of uh, really decent one drops. Some pretty spicy drops, new cards, especially yeah. if they kind of head a bit more in the pirate synergy direction. Mm-hmm. So it just means that you sometimes won't just lose to your opponent having lands that kill you. Yeah, yeah, that's hard. <laughs> I mean, it 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 felt really good to see that kind of red dominance for a little bit, mm, but especially now... because watching at least for the first few mirror matches was very interesting. Yeah, mm. it was uh, it was more calculated than you would expect for yeah. an aggro beatdown match. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I guess that's really it. I mean, standard is wide open, and it kind of makes me want to brew. So I might be doing that this week. Maybe. Yeah. There's there's definitely. Uh, more potential, at least until the format is once again solved, which it will be, which is fine. Mm-hmm. You know, there's at least if you know what the top decks are going to be, you can plan accordingly. Yeah. Right, which is probably why the pros aren't quite as happy about modern being the pro tour because they only have 15 card sideboards. I hear that. <laughs> I've, I've heard that a lot that the pros don't like some, modern. Some, some of the pros. Specifically for something like a pro tour where they actually have lots of cash online. Right, but. I don't know. I think that means that it levels out the field a little bit. Dude, I'm so stoked to watch the Pro Tour now. Oh, absolutely. I love watching Modern anyway, and just the fact that it's hopefully going to be just a really wide field makes me really interested in tuning in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Do we want to just continue down the list? Let's. There's a bunch of new things. Oh, There was a lot of news this week. So some at the very last minute. (laughs) So a couple things in Brazil, which, Mm -hmm. you know, is a little odd. But um, first of all... uh, of Pietro Damodorosa, uh, I think, pub- publicized the fact that in some of the Brazil printings, the new Rivals of Ixalan flip land cards have the wrong backs printed on them. That's hilarious. You never know which one you're going to get. So you mean like it's got the right land and then you flip it over and it's a totally different... It's, other, it's well, like other way around. Right. So it has the correct enchantment on it. Well, obviously, because okay. that yeah. is the front side, so that is the card. But when you flip it over, it doesn't have the correct land on the back. Oops. So instead of the one that's the Tolarian Academy, you could instead, you know, get the one that pumps your creature and gets it flying. Who knows? Well, that's awkward. How did that... I mean, legally, how does that work in a tournament? I have no idea. Well, they just Judge. play... Judge! I'm yeah. assuming they just replace <laughs> the card with a functional I, one. Maybe? I mean, it I says think... transform it, and if that's what's on the back, then is that the card you now have? I would assume not. But, look, if that happens to you, call a judge. <laughs> yeah, I would say so. <laughs> For sure. But, um, you know, just just more more evidence of Wizards printing not necessarily being quite where they want it to be. Speaking of printing errors, I've seen in my own card quality from the, um, from the pre-release that I went to, there were drastically different looking cards. Oh, yeah. I had, like, the same card from two different packs, and... Usually, I can see a difference between, like, if I've drafted a card at the beginning of a format mm-hmm. and at the end, it might look different. Sure. But not in the same, like, 
booster and, and not block. even just oh that looks a little odd wow that's in bold yeah kind of issues I had noticed in um, Hour of Devastation, a bunch of them had been, like, double printed. Yes. Yeah, yeah we saw that But several of the leaf pools. Is Wizards saying anything about this? No. No, not so oh, far. Oh, let me guess. We know nothing about it. That's right. Uh, um, the they... cards are great. They're the same as they've always been. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, if you don't say anything, then you can't be legally held accountable for it's it. true. Yeah. So, in more Brazil news, um, they released the playmat... For the Balboa uh, Pro Tour, I think it is, or the GP, but I think it's the Pro Tour. Um, doesn't look great. It's it's. Uh, I could do a better job of photoshopping. It it hurt me as a designer. <laughs> it hurt me a lot. I, um, the I color think... is the big problem. The variation in it just looks way out of yes, place. Yes, step. You took a look at it, and the first thing you said was, "Wow, that color palette is wildly different." And then you look closer and you're like, oh, and also the edges are really bad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But the first thing you notice is that the lighting between the picture they chose mm -hmm. and the picture they superimposed are completely different. Like, yeah. that's the first key to design, uh, making something look good, is make sure your light matches whatever yes. you're doing. You know, if light inconsistencies are are visible, then people are going to notice because mm -hmm. everyone knows where the sun comes from, right? Right. Like we're used to seeing a light source, so I don't know. Yeah, and it's pretty weird. I think, especially when you compare it to something like the Pax West uh, playmats, which they did, where they kind of copied in the Inventor's Fair. Feel. That looked real, real sweet. It looks great, and they incorporated, you know, elements of both the city it was being held in and the artwork itself on Inventor's Fair. And in mm -hmm. this one, they basically copied and pasted a picture of Huatli on a dinosaur in front of a picture of the city yeah. and called it a day. Mm -hmm. So, not, not to be the best. too negative or anything, just it's kind of funny if you want to go take a look it's at it. It's a little funny, yeah. Um, so next up, just a quick tidbit, an interesting note from a Mark Rosewater who, of course, is Magic's mouthpiece when it comes to talking about design choices. Yep. Um, so he basically was just talking about energy, because people have been mentioning how it's a <laughs> bit strong. A little bit. Um, and you can certainly check out his response for yourself if you'd like to go online and just read his, I think it was on his Tumblr probably, because that's where he posts most of his stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but basically he said that with energy, the problem was not the mechanic itself. The problem was just that they did not adjust the card costs to account for the added bonus of getting the energy. Yeah, um, he said a bunch about that on his Drive to Work episode on learning from Kaladesh too. Mm -hmm. And I, I have to say, I think I agree. Like, with, um, what do you call them, parasitic mechanics, yeah. they're hard to deal with because, you know, it relies on itself. But um, with alternate costs and parasitic mechanics like joining together, not only have, do you have to deal with the insular nature of a parasitic mechanic, but you have to deal with the fact that you're potentially making effects cheaper than they should be. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, like, if it costs enough of this alternate thing, that could be fine. That's what leads to an exciting game. Sure, like if, game. if Aetherwork Marble had cost 12 energy... Instead of, what was six, it, 8? Yeah. 8, yeah, something like that. Um then that probably would have been better. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't have been the scourge of standard for <laughs> the time. Yeah. Um, but it would have still been something like, yes, I can get there. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's always about tweaking these Johnny cards to make sure that they're <laughs> a goal that can be reached, but aren't just open to anybody. Yeah. Um, so as a result of that, he suggested that they might be willing to do energy again they just have to really work on yeah, getting it balanced honestly i think that's fine mm -hmm. like it was certainly flavorful yeah you know in the sense you're creating and using up energy to get extra effects that are specific to the plane and if they did mm -hmm. simply adjust the card costing correctly to account for the added bonus or cost of getting or using the energy mm -hmm. i'd i'd give it a try like it wouldn't turn me off a format it would be in in limited <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's kind of going to have to be a thing in Kaladesh. Mm. Like, you go back to Kaladesh, you're going to expect to see Aether. Yep. And I don't know how many people remember, but in the story for Kaladesh, it did say that Aether is something that exists everywhere in the mm. multiverse. It's just specifically um, potent, or it seemed to settle 
on Kaladesh. So we could see energy other places too. Probably not. And just think how sweet your Kaladesh cube would be without <laughs> Kaladesh sets. Right. <laughs> um, and the great thing about parasitic mechanics too is that they get less parasitic the more mm -hmm. times they use it. Yeah. So not only because they get the experience, but also just because the law of more, large numbers yeah. balances it out. Yeah. So that's interesting and hopeful. Yeah. I like that they're not shutting off the possibility. Like yes, yeah. When they went back to Mirrodin for Mirrodin Besiege, they decided not to do um, what was it affinity. Yep. Because they were like, we think we can do affinity without it being broken. <laughs> think? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe we'll just not. <laughs> um, yeah. And that's just because it made things cheap to free. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. that's always the problem. Yes. Oh, look, I have a free 4-4. Four -four. Yeah. Which, again, ties into that modern deck stuff, thinking about the <laughs> in In a format like modern, I think <laughs> you're, you're more open to crazy shenanigans like that then you should be in something like standard which is meant to be a format yeah you know um so just another small thing which i thought was kind of interesting um dice counters are no longer to be allowed uh for life totals poison counters or energy counters at the competitive or professional level rules enforcement so mm -hmm. this won't affect fnms correct but it will affect gps uh gp trials probably i think yeah i think um, so our bbqs that sort of thing and, and it makes me a little bit sad i understand it and i support it completely because i have been the victim of many a, a jostled <laughs> die um but it, it's, it makes me wonder, are they going to do away with giving you the D20 in the packs now? Oh, or, surely not. Surely or are not. they going to switch to giving you notepads? Now, for me, myself, as Steph and I, we, you and I were talking about this last night, um, when we go to GPs and such, we use paper and pen regardless. And I usually, the three months beforehand, go back to using paper and pen just to make sure my skills are up. <laughs> but at our, our local shop... If I don't have paper on me, I don't mind well, grabbing a Well, I actually a die. actively avoid using paper at our shop because there's not enough elbow room. Yeah, that's fair, that's too. Issue. That's fair, too. Yeah. Like, on busy nights, there's no room for you to not put your elbow, but to put your pad of paper without encroaching on someone else's play mat. So. Yeah. When it's crowded like that, I usually use the Digital Life app on my phone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that works, which too. That's going to be allowed, though. Yeah. Uh, not on no? a phone. No. Just oh, really? a boogie board. Yeah, because oh, okay. you can't have electronics. Yeah. Fair enough, fair enough. A boogie board doesn't store data, yeah. so... Whereas on a phone, you might have a cheat sheet or whatever. Yeah. Um, kind of like exams in high school. Yep. Could, could be Facebooking your mom for play advice. Right. <laughs> um, but I usually use that phone app, which keeps record of the game. And at you know a competitive tournament or at FNM, I usually use uh, pen and paper. And I can't count the number of times that it has been helpful. Absolutely. You know, well, like twice at the most recent pre-release, I was like, I have you at 11. <laughs> But you gained a life, right? I didn't write that down. Yeah, and that's it for me. When I'm at a competitive thing, I want to keep track of not only my life, but my opponent's life, and clearly. The, the judges very much want you to do this as well. Because yeah. when they get called over, it just means they have a more accurate representation of how you got to where you are. Yeah. yeah. Now, I still use the, um, the uh, spin downs specifically for tokens. When I don't have <laughs> um, uh, card-like tokens... Mm -hmm. I find the spin downs are nice and a good size that they don't just get lost on the play field. Yeah, you know? I mean, how do you represent that they're tapped? I turn them sideways. How do you know it's sideways? Because the spin downs have upright numbers. Yeah. Yes, but okay. I, mean, I also I'd pull be... them back a little farther from my main play field. Uh, as do I. I don't know, if I were your opponent, I'd still give you a, the upside down of a, of a card and... Say, mm -hmm. eh, put your dice on top of it. That'll represent, because uh, otherwise I just have a hard time keeping track of things on Fair the enough. board, but whatever. If I did that, I'm sure you would say, sounds good. Yep. Yep. Basically. So. Um, the funny thing, though, about this is just that in coverage, mm -hmm. they use dice to represent poison and energy counters. Oh, no. So for both <laughs> SCG and Wizards coverage, that's what they do. They have specific high contrast dice that they use on coverage. So they're going to have to come up with a new system to allow the players to keep track of it, but also for the viewers at home to keep track of it without having some guy on a whiteboard constantly changing numbers in front mm -hmm. of the camera. I assume they use D6s for that, mm -hmm. is that right? Yep. So D6s are nice and stable. Mm -hmm. 
I. But I they mean, can't do it according to the rules. There is no exception for coverage in these rules. Yeah, yeah. Maybe they'll add an exception for coverage, but that would kind of be hypocritical, wouldn't it? Yep. So, I don't know. They're going to have to figure it out. <laughs> It'll be a brave new world. <laughs> yeah, so I, I just thought that was kind of funny. I think it's a good um, policy. Yeah. I like it yeah, as a policy. Sure. I mean, at those particular levels, if you're playing in a competitive or professional level event, you want to be using the paper for that anyway. So yeah. mm-hmm. shouldn't be a big deal. Uh, next up, small note. Uh, the corset, well, small, I guess, note. Not, not something to worry about just yet. The corset for the summer has been moved up a week. So they will now pre-release the weekend of July 7th through 8th, which, you know, I am not 100% sure when the July 4th dot holiday is for the U.S., but it's the week after the Canada Day long weekend for us. So uh, everybody's going to be still hungover, probably. I don't know. Um, so pre-release July 7th through 8th, uh, and then the draft weekend starts July 14th. I, I wonder why. Why did they move it up? I mean, they I know were why so they... excited. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, sure. I mean, does this have anything to do with Masters 25 or... Here's here's my counter to that. I saw Mark Rosewater before Unstable came out. If anybody was more excited about a set ever, I don't know who. But they didn't move it up for him, you know? Okay, fine. Do it a week early. That sounds suspicious. I don't know. It It's odd. It's just kind of strange. It, yeah, so so there were like GPs and stuff planned around the original launch date, and also oh, pre-releases planned around the original pre-release date. Oops. So um, everybody gets to jog, uh, you know, move things around a little bit, yeah. and and hopefully there's you know sending out new posters with the correct dates on them and stuff. <laughs> That's mm-hmm. true too. To all the stores, mm-hmm. so that'll be exciting. Um, yeah, I doubt we'll have a good actual reason. Probably has to do a standard. Yeah, that would make sense. Yeah. But maybe it is, you know, Magic 25, who knows. Um, maybe they want an extra week of the core set to be in rotation. Maybe. Oh, that could be too, yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, next up are the two heavier topics. I made sure to backload it all for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's talk negative first. Okay. Magic released a statement announcing the fact that they want... Uh, employees and basically anyone who has anything to do with magic communities in a professional fashion to have to go through a background check in order to work around, quote, children. And I say that in quotes because the majority of magic players are not children and the majority of magic employees do not work alone with children. Uh Yeah. This whole thing just seems really ill-conceived to me. Right. So there are a number of problems with this. It basically means the way that it's worded, and they had an employee who posted on a Facebook, uh, uh, like, for for wizards, people in the the wizards network, um, answered more questions, which were basically, shrug, ask a a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Um, But... That's helpful. Yeah, so they clarified the fact that anybody who works with the public in a shop that has anything to do with magic has to do a background check. So that shop that's just selling random half a dozen... No, no, anything, anybody that uh, has events. Mm. So, well, so, like, Walmart is exempted because they don't hold well, events. Well, I assume they're not part of the Wizards Network. Right, the Play Network. Yeah. Um, so, basically, it means, let's say your shop has D&D on Tuesdays, and there are no children there, and there is no magic there. Your D&D leader has to get a background check. That seems a little extreme. It's also incredibly unenforceable. Yeah, and, and I mean, don't get me wrong. I am, as somebody who taught children's theater for years, I am very much um, for making sure we try our best to keep kids safe and have people that aren't going to possibly do them harm. Teachers get background checks once every whatever um when we have people come in that they're going to be spending time alone with kids with young children they get background checks which makes logical sense but this seems a little well i mean there are multiple problems first of all what you can do in the u.s is not at all what you can do basically anywhere else in the world and not only that it varies among states in the u.s Mm -hmm. in california where channel fireball the people running the gps is located you can't do this 
Not allowed. Not you, allowed. You can't ask. Yeah, basically. So unless you're in a vulnerable, uh, a, a position with a vulnerable individual. I have no idea. Yeah. You'd have to ask your lawyer. Sure. Channel well, Fireball. I'm in, quoting Canada. And, well, the thing is, in Canada, it varies widely based on province. Yeah. And not only that, it varies based on city. Yeah. And even in cities, you need to get a letter from the person who's requesting the background check, like as in the employer, not the individual getting mm-hmm. the check, stating what it's needed for and why. And it has to actually be a good reason or they will say, no, we're not going to give you this. Because yeah. Canada has regular background checks and then vulnerable sector checks which are required for people working one-on-one with children yeah Yeah. i had one when i worked in a daycare yeah i would not consider a shop that sells cards which by the way magic is not a children's game i mean there are children who play it but it's an everyone game Mm -hmm. um that's not a good reason (laughs) well not only i mean i don't know about all of the magic shops but the ones that i've been in like there's the shop Mm-hmm. Maybe there's a bathroom. Yeah. There's, like, w- nothing can happen. Like, it's just silly. It's not even that it's unenforceable. It's just that when asked specifically what should we do around this type of issue regarding different legalities in various places, Wizard said, eh, figure it out. Ask a lawyer. You know. But we're going to sue you if something goes wrong. So this isn't just judges. This is shopkeepers, part-time mm-hmm. employees that work mm-hmm. for the shop. People who who are at GPs. This and... is event leaders for for things that have nothing to do with the magic at the shop if it's in the same location. Right. And uh... again, uh, in Canada anyway, you need to get a different vulnerable sector check for every employer who is asking for one. So let's say you're a judge in a small town with, or, uh, you know, a town the size of the one that we're in, Mm -hmm. where there are five or six magic shops. Mm -hmm. If you want to judge at five or six magic shops, you have to request and purchase. In our town, it costs $45 for a vulnerable sector check for employment purposes. You have to purchase one for each shop. Yeah. And if you ask too many times, the RCMP will start fingerprinting you. Because they'll be very curious as to why you need five vulnerable sector checks for five employers. Yeah. So, you know, if it it's not great, especially given the fact that they really haven't put out much more information about what it is, but you better have it done within three weeks, because that's when the deadline is for this to happen. I'd, I'd like to think that this and everything else that has really disappointed me about Wizards of the Coast in the last, let's say, year has been because Hasbro made them. But I doubt it. Hasbro would have run this by a better lawyer, I would think. Yeah. At least so someone with this, international expertise. Is this set in stone? Is there going to be discussion? Are they going... Do you think they're going uh-huh. to, to bow to enough backlash? Wizard said in their initial statement, we will be providing more details. Okay, so they haven't given... Allegedly. All of the... Okay. The problem is, first of all, maybe that employee who posted on the WPN Facebook page was the additional details. Second of all... <laughs> it's not like they're pushing back the deadline for when this has to happen based on when it is that they give the additional details. Mm. Third, in Canada, at least in the town that we're in, it takes at least six weeks to get a vulnerable sector check back. Oh, so have, we haven't had the opportunity to speak to anybody who this is going to directly affect. Uh, we, spoke we spoke with our John. shop judge. Yeah. Have we? Friend and of the show, John. John. Judge John. He was not super impressed either. Uh, he, he also mentioned that it's unenforceable in Canada, which we already knew. And he also brought up privacy concerns. Yeah. Your store owner has to keep on file the results of this criminal background check. Mm. Let's say you are somebody who has something not related to children, but something else on your criminal background check that might come up. Mm. That will be kept... In your shop's very extensive and locked filing cabinet that they keep nowhere, like... In the boot of their car? Yeah, like... (laughs) Like... (laughs) Oi. Oh, this is a sticky wicket. And not only that, people have pointed out, I mean, not even a week ago, that Magic said, we want to make this a safe and welcoming environment for everybody. A couple of trans judges have come out and said, this will provide my legal name, my dead name for the identity that I no longer use, mm-hmm. to anybody I wish to judge for. Mm. 
Yeah, I don't know. I wonder who their lawyer even, was originally. Even it will just wizards. reveal the fact that they're trans, which maybe they their Aren't. shop owners don't yeah. know. Yeah. It makes me question their, their legal team that this isn't all, you know. It's just very slapdash and doesn't yes. feel very so it, thought through. It, it feels to me like a complete knee jerk reaction to Jeremy, that what's his face is dude, where he said, Oh, yeah, magic is full of pedophiles, which I believe we talked about last week when we said that the magic judge community came out with a great response to it. No, I don't think we ended up talking about uh, it. They did. You can check it out on the uh, MTG Judge places um and basically they said we take things by a case-by-case basis if we are made aware of any judge who has any allegations against them of this sort of activity we remove them from the judge roster Mm. that's exactly what they should be doing they should be taking things on a case-by-case basis anything should be doing with that kind of thing Yeah. yeah like it would be a different story if we were hearing about rampaging magic judges going around molesting half the children in, you know, in GPs or something like that. But I don't think I've ever heard of a single I've case of anything. It like would that. also be different if judges were employees and yes, paid, you know? for for Pokemon because that is a children's card game for children. Mm-hmm. Judges are employees, and they are required to do background checks, which their employers pay for mm-hmm. and track. Now that sounds like the right way to do things if that is what you are like I have no issue with this child's kind of mm-hmm. geared game having people get To be clear, we're not saying that Pokemon is just for kids. Oh but no, no, it is there's a lot of adults. children. Yeah, right. Right? It, Versus it makes magic no qualms about it. Everybody well, I guess. Magic is geared towards like Honestly, I don't know that many young kids. 20 to 30-year-olds? Well, it's, it's mostly, I, th- I would say, teens and up. Okay. The majority, you're probably going to get teens and up, right? So, and, and honestly, if your child is younger than that, you should be with them when they're playing Magic. Mm-hmm. Don't just dump them off at the shop and leave. Like, that's just responsible parenting. Yeah. And if something does happen, the odds are it will be just somebody at the shop, not a judge. Mm-hmm. Right? It just seems really slapdash. It seems knee-jerk. It seems like it's giving the moral victory to people trying to rabble-rouse mm-hmm. who have since claimed credit for apparently, you know, uh, uncovering the giant pedo conspiracy of magic judges or whatever nonsense. Mm-hmm. So hopefully they will come out with a policy that is clear and rational and legal and they will answer all questions and everybody will be happy with the resolution. But uh, otherwise, I would be very upset if I were a person who this was impacting. Yeah. I'm like I'm just annoyed and frustrated by it as somebody who, who works the game. as somebody who works in in a field where this sort of thing is required, where vulnerable sector checks are required. Mm-hmm. Like it just annoys me to see it taken so frivolously. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, we make sense of this soon. Yes. <laughs> so last up, you know in better news? In, in news news, uh, Wizards have uh, announced kind of the first draft, I would say, of their magic uh, arena um, economy. Yeah, uh, that article came out today, yep. and I was um, pleasantly, pleasantly surprised. I thought it looked interesting and honestly a little bit unique, and I was not expecting that. Yeah, so I guess we can probably throw a a link to their article in the show notes just because it is actually new news Mm -hmm. but did you want to summarize it for us basically um basically you have uh two kinds of currencies which is not new for a Mm -hmm. free to pay game yes uh you have the currency that you can accrue and the currency that you can buy with real world money right um i didn't i don't remember what you could use each for though um, well, basically, uh, so let's say that I think gems are the ones that you accrue in game. So Monica let's go with that. Um, so yeah. yeah, so let's let's say that. So the ones that you accrue in game, you can use. They said for basically anything related to gameplay. Okay. They said that the ones that you buy with cash money will be also used for all of those things. Okay. Or also for possibly cosmetic things. Okay. Which I think is fine. I think everybody thinks that that's fine. Yeah, that sounds reasonable. The, the question is just uh, how do they relate and how much time is required to accrue the in-game right. stuff. Right, and I imagine that the stuff you pay for is going to be a lot faster than the stuff that you accrue over time. Sure. Um, but what really interested me was 
how do we get boosters? How do we do we draft with them? You know, mm-hmm. are there? Um, and they came out with their method of um, getting us cards, and they have something that's called is it just called boosters? Yeah, the eight card. Yeah. Um, so a booster you can purchase with in-game currency, and it will have five commons, two uncommons, and a rare or mythic rare. I think so. You can also buy it with cash money. Sure. <laughs> um, they also have something called draft packs, yes, which will have fourteen cards. It's like a regular, real-world magic booster, but without the land. Yeah. And you'll be using them to draft. Yes. So they will support draft. Hooray! I'm going to check that out as soon as I get into the beta, which I haven't gotten my email. Yeah. Come on, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hear if you email him directly, he'll make sure you get on the priority priority list. No, that's uh. why. Probably shouldn't do that. Um, so <laughs> speculations are just that with the draft packs, you will simply say, I would like to pay, play a draft. Here is my 15 cold hard cash dollars or a zillion gems or whatever. Yeah. And you will be provided with three draft packs, which we, you will open in normal drafting fashion. Yeah, they didn't actually come out with how much any of this is going to cost. Correct. They just came out with, this is the method we're fooling around yeah, with. Yeah, which I think is fine. They're obviously just in the preliminary stages. Um, so the real interesting part, though, about this is that they, how, how you're going to get the cards that you want to acquire. Mm-hmm. So each uh, booster or draft... Uh, no, just the boosters, have a chance of having a wild card mm-hmm. at any of the rarities, and you can chain, exchange those for any card of that rarity in the set that you're looking at. Yeah. So I thought that was kind of neat, because, you know, if you have... I don't know if it said if you could hold on to them. Well, it. I mean, it's basically like if you get an Ixalan wild card, you can only use it for Ixalan cards. Right. But if you're looking for that, you know, chase uncommon that you haven't been able... Uh, what is it? The, um, the Chupacabra. The Chupacabra. Uh, and you haven't been able to get one yet, then you can trade one of these wild card uncommons for a Chupacabra. Mm-hmm. So I think that's pretty neat. Sure. You uh, disagree? The, so so continue along, to continuing along with that. Okay. So you don't get extra cards. As in, once you hit a play set of a card... Sure, because that's all than, you're going to need. Right, rather than continuing on getting five, six, seven of them, which is kind of, we'll call it the Hearthstone model, I guess. It's kind of how most uh, games do. They, they say, oh, you have too many. Would you like to disenchant them uh-huh. to get fairy dust? Yeah, then you and can then use you... to craft new cards. Right. But that's not the way magic is going. Right. So instead, once you, you know, hit Chupacabra number 10, <laughs> long may he reign... Um, you know, once once you get past four, it starts filling up a vault meter. Mm-hmm. Again, they don't really know the numbers on how many it'll take to fill up the vault or anything like that. Um, your vault will bust open, and you will get some wild cards, I think is what they said. Which I think is pretty neat. It's a different kind of model. Right, so then you say, oh, great. Well, rather than all of these cards that I already have a play set of, I will instead choose, uh, you know... These other uncommons that I don't have a place set up yet. Yeah. Or rares or whatever. mythics or yeah. whatever it is that you end up so, with. So, the concern I've seen raised about this... Okay. Let's say, hypothetically, <laughs> I don't like playing red. Okay. And I know that I don't want to build a standard deck with any red cards. All right. Well, I think that's a little silly because red is a perfectly fine color. Hypothetically. But let's go with that. I cannot say I would like to get rid of all of these red cards that I do not have a playset of, but that I know I will never need for standard. Ah. And change them into cards I will actually use for the standard deck I'm trying to build. I see. Because you can't disenchant cards. Hmm. I hadn't thought about that. You have to wait until you have a playset of the unplayable jank rares that you are forced to, to, to open in your packs... And only once you have a playset of them can you start exchanging them in for other cards. But why wouldn't you want a playset of everything in your collection? I don't understand. Mm hmm. Huh. <laughs> so let's say you're trying to build. Let's let's even flip it around. Let's say you're trying to build Ram and App Red. <laughs> the adjusted version. <laughs> well, yeah. The adjusted version. So let's say you're trying to get all the red cards mm-hmm. and you don't want any other decks. So you don't want any other colored cards. 
you have to just keep opening boosters until you have enough duplicate or well quadruplicates uh, to start filling up your your vault meter, and then you have to wait until your vault meter pops to get wild cards. Hmm. So you either dump a ton of time or a ton of money to get a standard deck. Now keep in mind, none of this applies for draft. We don't really know how much grinding on the standard ladder it's going to take to get any drafts, because you do keep what you draft. Mm. So this only applies for standard. But if you play standard on Mitko, you just buy the deck you want and you go. Yeah. And, if... and standard on Mitko is usually not that expensive. Is it not? I don't actually know. No, Rel- it's relatively. It's, it's much less than yeah, paper. Yeah, it's, it's much cheaper than on paper. And also, I assume it's going to be cheaper than randomly acquiring cards until you get the ones you need. Yeah. I mean, cheap in Magic is sort of a misnomer anyway, because this is a really expensive game. But uh, So, I, again, hmm. their model is all preliminary. Right. I assume somebody will bring this to their attention. And if they decide not to fix it, that might just influence the number of people who decide to play Standard in Mitko versus the number of people who play Standard in Arena. Yeah. I think the, uh, well, the interface is going to have something to do with who wants to play it, but the monetization method is probably going to be more critical because people care about their money. Well, I think the other thing about, you know, the online economy is just that they're not competing really with Mitko. They're competing with Hearthstone. Yeah. And Eternal and Hex and all of the other free-to-play games where, you know, some of them have better monetization systems, some of them have worse ones based on whether you're spending money or time. But if you're just looking for a game that flows really smoothly and that costs you, you know, not as much time in order to get the most bang for your, you know, fake buck, I suppose, in those cases, the game itself may not be the thing that gets you sticking around. Hmm. So, predictions. Do you think they're going to switch to a dusting system before they're out of beta? I hope not. I hope they just come up, maybe, you know, uh, if you take five cards rather than, like, dusting them, you can turn them into a wild card. Okay, yeah. Or maybe you can change like for like. Um, Four green common can get you four red commons that you want. So, like, once you have a playset, you could say... Switch it for um, a play set of another color. At the same level. Yeah. Or, you know, even half of a play set or something like that. Yeah. Like, I assume that if this is something that becomes a concern to them, because obviously their goal is to make money, yeah. which is fine, but our goal as players is to be able to get the most out of the experience for what we are willing to put in. And in order for them to make money, they're going to have to give us the most out of our experience. That... Sure, but the thing is, I mean... You would pay 10 bucks to do a draft on Magic Arena. I would. Considering it costs us 20 bucks to do a draft on Mitko. I'd prefer to pay less. <laughs> I'd prefer to pay, I don't know. Sure, would you pay, you know, uh, $3 or something to do a ghost draft on Arena? Yeah. Yeah, all the time. You you just keep giving them your cash, right? Yeah, so, absolutely. So I love are, drafting. There's certainly a bunch of different ways that they can monetize the various aspects of this. Hmm. So, again, they're just in the testing phase. So they are welcoming feedback if you have thoughts on this feel free to check out their article and then let them know you know oh i really only want to draft one deck and standard at a time i would prefer a way to acquire decks much quickly much much quicker without the randomness yeah Hmm. makes sense yeah all right well we'll have to keep an eye on that because um if not currently arena is going to be the future of online play most likely for some formats yeah mm-hmm. i think i think they've made it fairly clear that they're probably not going to be putting in the older sets so if you want to play legacy vintage modern even mm-hmm. you'll still be playing Mecco. but if you want to draft standard events or you want to play standard you're going to be on arena i think hmm yeah interesting mm-hmm. something to keep an eye on yes all right, so where does that leave us? That leaves us with the weekend. <laughs> we know, so, guys. What happened this weekend? So I'll go first. All right, so here's the thing. <laughs> I love when your stories start like that. <laughs> so first of all, I generally do fine at pre-releases. Uh, the last few pre-releases I've at least gotten prizes, which is good. Our, our, our store does usually the largest pre-release in the city. 
Um, second of all, I usually don't open anything sweet in my pre-release pool. Usually I just put together something like a, a green-white mid-range Some, yeah. deck. Yeah. Really curvy. People in the yeah. face. You don't yep. open anything sweet, so you're forced to go the, the value route. So, <laughs> so here's the thing. Uh-oh. I opened a few bombs. Uh-huh. So I opened an Angrath, the Planeswalker in black-red. Nice. I opened uh, that Ixalan Dinosaur, the 7-6 Trample for Naya Colors, uh, that whenever she deals damage to the face of your opponent... I can't remember uh, She name. flips dinosaurs off the top to put them into play. Good Not gravy. Uh, Gishalt. No. Gishath. No. Um, I also yeah. opened one of those, the uh, the 12 mana 12-12 with <laughs> Trample. Oh my goodness. Yum, 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 so, yum. So, if... I were trying to win actual caches or prizes at the pre-release. What I would have done is <laughs> built a very good green-white dinosaur deck with that top end. Mm-hmm. Just, you know, a couple of dinosaurs. Or I would have built the other decks I had in my pool. I had a green, uh, blue-green merfolk deck. I don't think it was quite as good just because I probably would have had to splash a third color. Or I could have gone green or black Blue pirates splashing the red for the Angrath off of my treasure makers, of which I had several in blue. But instead, what I decided to do... (laughs) (laughs) Because it sounded like more fun? Because I don't usually let myself... Look, I I am very much a Timmy. I love playing for fun. Mm -hmm. But when there's money on the line, I will usually take things seriously and just build a curve out deck and try and win. But every once in a while, you just got to let your hair down a little bit and play for fun and kind of hang out at the, 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 the loser's end of the of the room. So I built green, white, red, black. How much fixing did you have? Fair amount. Well, that's so probably had, another push. So I was, I was core green, white. I had one of the green, white, three drops that taps for any color mana. That seems sweet. I had two... Fully on colored dual lands. Sweet. Uh, I had the black, green, and the red, white ones. Well, you were playing four colors. It's not I had difficult. Two tra- I had two Traveler's Amulets. Uh-huh. That all sounds great. Uh, it, it does. Yeah. How'd it run? Um. <laughs> first of all, somebody convinced me to splash a double black card. Who was that? I don't know, I don't... but he was talking... Silliness. I did go along with it, though, because I knew I was going to do poorly with this deck anyway, so I figured was I might as well go the whole hog. Was that your Chupacabra? No, no. that was my, my Impale. Right, yes. <laughs> so, look. The one game where I... Or, well, the one match, rather, where I actually drew a combination of lands and spells, mm-hmm. and I drew my low drop spells before my high drop spells, mm-hmm. I stomped my opponent dead silly. That sounds sweet. Like, curb stomped. Like, 12-12 hitting you in the face, turn turn six. Kind oh. of up, killed, dead, super dead. Very dead. <laughs> that would but, be very dead. But then there were the other games where uh, I I flooded a lot. Like, how many lands were you running? Uh, well, I wasn't sure, but, like, how many how many to do. Because I did have the two Traveler's Amulets, but two of my lands were tapped, and two of my mana sources were Traveler's Amulets, basically. So I think mm. I was 16. With a bit of card selection, I had a bit of explore. But the problem was, I never quite drew the right colors for what I needed to do. Oh. So, I'm not going to claim that it was all variants. <laughs> <laughs> Part of it was just that I was in a four-color deck, and this format is actually not that slow. Uh. If I'd had more time, it would have been fine. But, you know... I don't really care. I got to cast my Angrath a couple of times. I got to cast my, my Naya dinosaur a couple of times. I got to cast my, my, my 12-12 a couple of times. Mm-hmm. So when it worked, it worked hard. That sounds like fun. So it was very fun. I did not do well at all. <laughs> but it was very fun, and I knew going in it was not going to do very well. So it just meant that I was taking the whole thing very lightheartedly, which mm-hmm. is great, because then me and my opponents, we just kind of sat around. We... We, you know, had a lot of fun chit-chatting back and forth. and We should go as Johnny, Timmy, and Spike next Halloween. <laughs> I, think it's very, I get the cool shirt. I think yeah, it's very funny what people focus on. Like, I showed a few people, like, you know, stuff. I showed you my, my, my deck and, and Judge John. I showed him my deck and everything. And all that you, well, at least rifling through, specifically 
you know, before you see the actual pool, all you do is you go through and you go, oh, wow, look at these bongs. Your deck is gross. And then I have to go, yes, but my curve is really bad. Yeah. And my removal is really bad. Well, that's why we curve things out on a table. Like, when you hand someone a deck mm-hmm. and they leaf through it, it's like, okay, you've got maybe one of those hammer skulls. That's good. And this is a good card. And this is a good card. So you see all the good cards. Yeah. You but don't, you, you don't... don't see the curve. <laughs> yeah. So I, I just thought that was kind of funny because... Because I would then say, no, it's actually a really bad deck. Uh-huh. You should probably take another look. At it, it's it. just fun. It's Yeah. So I had a lot of fun. I did really badly, but I knew that that was what was going to happen. And I opened some sweet cards. So I'm stoked I got to play them in a limited format. Because mm. it's the worst when you have a couple of bombs and you just can't play them. Because mm-hmm. that's it's what happens the best to me deck. all the time. Or it's really bad when you open bombs and you can't play them because it's not in an actual limited yeah. draft. Yeah. You yeah. know, like your prize packs or whatever. When you're playing Pack Wars. Yeah. You remember that time I brought home two packs in the pre-release. We played Pack Wars. Yes. My, the first one I opened had a Gideon. And the second one had a Liliana. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Those are some pretty good packs. It was pretty hey, good. Yeah. Good value. Yeah. I was I was quite pleased. So how did you do, Step? Uh, how did you do, Tams? Tams didn't go. Oh. <laughs> I didn't go. I stayed home and cleaned the house because we had people Yay, coming over. Yeah, cleaning the house. Let's pick one for the team. Well... I did go, and uh, I did okay. I honestly, looking at my deck, I thought I was going to crush. Mm -hmm. You know, I opened some pretty sweet stuff as well. I opened uh, Azor, the Lawbringer. Yeah, that's the blue white Sphinx's Rev on a stick. Mm -hmm. My my promo was Dire Fleet Daredevil, which I thought was going to be pretty sweet Mm -hmm. if I could make it work. I opened Tetsamok Primal Death. That's a black legendary dinosaur. Yep, or elder dinosaur. I opened Waker of the Wilds, which is a pretty sweet um, merfolk that just awakens your lands. Mm-hmm. Oh, that guy can be really good if it's late game. It was... Okay, so I've got a game to tell you about sure. later. And I opened uh, Zakama, Primal Calamity. That would be the 9-drop Naya guy with three activated abilities He's and a disgusting. wall of text. Yeah, so I really didn't know which way to go because obviously those rares are pulling you in completely different um, directions. You're not wrong. I also, I I had to read them on the fly because I decided to go to a pre-release without doing a set review. Mm -hmm. And, okay, so I wanted to have the experience of not knowing the set when I was opening it up to see how I um, evaluate evaluate cards on the fly. And it turns out the same as I normally do, but a lot more rushed. (laughs) So I don't think I'll do that again because I like being prepared. Fair enough. But I didn't really read uh, the Primal Calamity thoroughly because I'm like... I told you you should run him in your deck no matter what your deck was. But Azur the Lawbringer has Sphinx's Rev. You can be four colors. I I did it. So I ended up being four (laughs) colors anyway and not running either of them. Um, My deck that I originally put together because I thought it was just solid was Mm -hmm. black-green, mid-range, splashing a... um, uh, charging Monstrosaur. Monstrosaur and a Dead Eye Brawler off of three lands and a Traveler's Amulet. Mm-hmm. And it worked. That worked really well um, for the first few games. And then for some reason. Then you got into the winner's bracket. I just kept flooding. <laughs> I, I flooded and flooded and flooded. And it's really frustrating. Yes. But uh, I, I will mention that one game, both me and my opponent were flooding, but I dropped, uh, what is it, Waker of the Wilds? Yep. And then top-decked nine land in a row. Good thing you could turn them into creatures! Oh yeah, I had a couple of 18-18s. Oh jeez. <laughs> I won that game. <laughs> Needless this to is say. unnecessary. Well, yes, because because you can double up on an individual land, right? And just yes. Keep making it bigger and bigger and bigger. It was not unnecessary because he had a um, a board, so I needed to make sure that my creatures were big enough that he couldn't just stack block and yeah. and kill them. Because by that point, why I was, you have more? Yeah, um, <laughs> there were other things going on, but I was happy to win that game. It was anyone's game for the longest time. Yeah. Oh, he also had a Tetsamok. Uh, oh, jeez. So. In one game, um, he started 
putting prey counters on my creatures. Yeah. So I just didn't play any more creatures until yeah. eventually he cast his Tetsamok, wiped my board, and then I put a prey <laughs> counter on his Tetsamok, dropped mine, and he swiftly bound it. Aww. And I lost. <laughs> but it was really, really fun. Um, so by the end of the fifth round, it was six rounds, mm -hmm. I was two and three. And I was feeling okay, but I thought, man, I really thought this deck was better than that. Yeah, so at our store, that's fine, but it's out of prizes. Yeah, it's way out of prizes. Well, not way out of prizes. Your tiebreakers but... make you way out of prizes. Yeah. Um, so I had been being bullied by my friends all day to yeah. run my big giant dinosaur. Monsters. Uh, so I decided at the last minute, okay, fine. I will rebuild into the Primal Calamity. Yeah, you do. And can I just say that... Um, what is it? Dire Fleet Daredevil, the two drop, two one with first strike that. Oh, yeah, that's the reverse. Uh, Snapcaster. Snapcaster. Um, what was it being called? Slapcaster. Yes. <laughs> um, I like when that. it enters the battlefield, exile an instant or sorcery from an opponent's graveyard, and you may cast that card. So people say they want to cast that late once there's stuff down. Well, I just threw it out there on Yeah, two. it's a two mana, two one with first strike. Yeah. It's great. It's red. That's. All red would like to do on two. I put a prying blade on it. My <laughs> opponent decided not to block it three or four times in a row. Mm -hmm. um, so I already had him Presumably very because they didn't just want to lose their creatures for nothing. Sure. Yeah. Um, but that also let me get get uh, the Primal Hunter out on turn, I think, seven or six. Because I had dropped a five drop on four and a six drop on... Um, just using your treasures on from your five. prying blade? Yeah. We found the deck for it. Also... What is it? The red, um, I want to say treasure cruise, but, but it's not that. Uh, Pirate's Pillage. Uh, three and a red for a sorcery that you pitch a card and draw two cards and create two treasures. Yeah. Well, that's Very good. all the way deck. to um, <laughs> the pr Primal Calamity right there. Yeah. So I cast uh, Zakama Primal Calamity, my opponent at 14, I think, in, in the one game. Um, untapped my lands. Because yeah. that's what it allows you to do, right? Yeah. Past the turn, with all my mana Your off, move. he just played something, and then end of turn, I'm like, I kill three of your creatures, and he's nap conceded. Seems good. I should have been playing that deck <laughs> all day. Well, basically the card says win the game on it. Yeah. It, it really kind of does. Like, if you, they don't have something that kills it... Because, like, Ixalan's Binding... Well, yeah, Ixalan's Binding takes it out. Um, but what's the pacifism? Pacifism doesn't do anything to the lightning mm -hmm. bolt on a stick. Well, and the other thing is that even if they, you know, do have the removal for it, they have to do it while the untap your land triggers are on the stack, or else you will then just untap your lands and deal nine damage to some things. Mm -hmm. And if it's not the last card in your hand, well, at least you still get to untap your lands and maybe play something, yeah. right? Yeah. So, yeah, it is very strong. I'm going to first pick it if I see it in a draft. And oh, then yes. Draft the heck out of it. Absolutely. So, I end up three and three, and that was fun. Seems good. Mm -hmm. So, last on our list, we are continuing our, our journey into Dominaria. Yes, and we're uh, kind of running out of time, so I'll just talk about one of the um, key characters from Dominaria. We'll deal with Teferi and Karn next week. Okay. But I have. And Liliana. Sure, right. We don't know that she's going to be there, but... Just in case. Probably. So, the uh, character who appeared on the key art um, that is not a planeswalker was Joyra of the Gitu. And Joyra, Teferi, and Karn are all kind of what I want to call accidental shit disturbers. <laughs> they, they don't mean to cause trouble, but they just do. Trouble finds them. Yeah. Um, so Joyra comes from a um, an island continent called Shiv. Mm -hmm. uh, of the Shivan Reef, Shivan Dragon. Shiv, that's right. Shivan in the face. <laughs> so it it is a fire island. It's um, the largest source of red mana on Dominaria, basically. Mm -hmm. And the uh, Gitu tribe who live there are um, mostly artificers and red mages. 
So Joyra fits right in there. She's an artificer and a red mage. I don't remember what her card does, but it's appropriate. Um, it's both red and blue. Sure. Um, the island of Shiv are, also has power stone mines, so all of those like artifacts that that generate power for Urza's experiments. You mean like worn power stone and? Uh, yeah, basically stuff like that. Um, they come from that region. So Joyra comes from there. And she was a student at the Tolarian Academy with Teferi. Mm-hmm. Tolarian Academy on Teleria in yeah, yeah, in Teleria West. Um, she's actually the person responsible for naming Karn. Oh. Karn literally comes from, like, Cairn. So she called him a stack of stones. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it stuck. <laughs> That's cute. Um... She is immortal now because of shenanigans that went on with the uh, Temporal Rifts, um, which Oops. we'll be talking about next week because it's Teferi's fault. Okay. Um, but she basically drank water that had been siphoned through time, and now she's she was there for years alone hmm. drinking time water. And so now she's immortal, which explains why she's the same age that she was back way back then. I guess. Um... Yeah, uh, she was also the original captain of the Weatherlight from, like, before the Weatherlight saga happened, mm -hmm. and uh, she accidentally allowed the Phyrexians into the Tolarian Academy, Whoops. which uh, is why I mean she's an what I say she's an accidental. Uh, well, I don't know if I would call that trouble. <laughs> yeah. That's the oopsie you just can't take back. Yeah. Well, it, funny, when we talk about Karn, they did take it back. <laughs> nice. It's one of these things. So, the Tolarian Academy is basically uh, Professor X's school for gifted youngsters in magic. Okay. Um, it's where, it's a school for magic that um, is run by Urza, the headmaster. Well, he rebuilt it. Um so that he can fight the Phyrexians in his ever, uh, never-ending war. Except it's over now because he's dead, we think. Uh -oh. And the Phyrexians are supposedly... <laughs> yeah. The Phyrexians are also supposedly dead. We'll find out. I, I honestly think, after refreshing myself on the history, we're probably going to see something about the Phyrexians, um, when we return to Dominaria. Because, um... They're tied intimately with Karn's backstory, uh, which we'll get into next week. But Joyra's really um, kind of a a fascinating character in that she's a fairly strong female character mm -hmm. in a time when it would have been surprising to see strong female characters written into um, generic fantasy books, mm -hmm. I guess. I don't know. Is that does that sound accurate, or am I giving fantasy writers too little credit? Uh, when would this have been? Ninety four. Yeah. I mean, it was still in development. You certainly get like Tamara Pierce and things like that writing before them, but mm. you know. I did like um, one of the quotes that was on a card that's attributed to Joyra. Uh, what is mana but possibility? An idea not yet given form. Sounds very blue red. Yeah, she's <laughs> she's passionate. She um, didn't like the wimpy kind of boys who hung out at the academy. She was looking for a stronger man, like you'd find on um, on Shiv, and headed out kind of with that in mind, rather than settle into a company that didn't suit her. Interesting. Um, and I, I wish I had remembered to look up what her card does, but it doesn't really matter. I hope when we come to Dominaria that they're not going to magically make her into a planeswalker. I honestly like legendary creatures yeah. a little more than planeswalkers at times. Yep. When they are, I don't know, it's so much easier to see a person in their element given flavor to mm -hmm. the story versus a planeswalker who is by definition kind of outside of events and that's what Teferi and Karn are kind of going to be 
Although Teferi might not be a planeswalker anymore. So I, I don't know. We're already kicking an hour. So do you want to read what Joyra All right. did? Joyra of the Gitu. One colorless, one blue, one red. For a 2-2 two, two legendary creature human wizard at rare. Uh, two colorless, remove a non-land card in your hand from the game. Well, two generic. Oh, Which sorry. is important because this is a cost. Fair. Yeah. Put four time counters on the removed card. If it doesn't have suspend, it gains suspend. Right. So suspend is dealing specifically with the temporal portals and the story that she and Teferi were mixed up in. Makes sense with the time stream and stuff. Yeah. Um, we'll talk about Karn the Silver Golem and all mm-hmm. that next week. But uh, we're kind of out of time. <laughs> Unless there's anything else you wanted to know about Joyra that I can actually answer. So we left her wandering off into the cosmos in search of a strong male? Um, well, she found a strong male, which was the problem. She That was the sleeper agent that she let into uh, the Tal- Talarian Academy. Well, I guess she wasn't wrong. No. Um, he did become sort of a, an evil mastermind and then died. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, that part puts a damn thing. So, so where did she leave off then? She left off. Um, it's kind of unclear. Um, I think she went back to Shiv in the end. Um, Teferi went home. She went home, and they had after they dealt with the time um, stream problem. They kind of just parted ways, and then we followed Karn for a bit. So I'm not sure where she ended up, except that she's apparently wandering around being immortal. Hmm. As like you. you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. That was, that's really neat. All right. Well, I guess we'll find out even more next week. Mm-hmm. Huzzah. And I'll have to figure out what we know about Liliana. <laughs> Just, you know, relating to, to, to Dominaria stuff, not necessarily what she's been off of about doing and making deals and stuff like that right okay yes so um thanks for joining us Uh and we will see you next week when we'll start our story time a little earlier i think well less news probably i was gonna say less news it was a lot of news this week yeah yeah Yeah. bye hello and welcome to no we're gonna start again (laughs) are we yes